Hey all here, OS Reviews, you're watching our video review of the Yoda Phone 2 in 2018. So this is a device that's now over two years old, and we've since seen the Yoda Phone 3 that was just released during the summer, but that device does not come with as high-end specifications as I think many people were hoping for. It comes with a Snapdragon 625, which means it's a very mid-end phone, similar to a lot of Xiaomi and Redmi devices, compared to the Yoda Phone 2, which was more of a flagship level device when it first launched. So this is a device that you can still find on eBay and Amazon for between $150 to $200, so it's definitely more affordable than when it was first launched uh, with an over $600 price tag. It's a unique device because it has a dual screen design. On the back there is an e-ink panel, and just like on Kindles and ebook readers, that means when the device is turned off, it can still be displaying a static image because it only uses electricity when the screen changes to a different pattern. You can use this screen to read books, you can also use it to scan a QR code such as a plane ticket or a boarding pass at an airport, so it's actually quite useful in addition to wallpapers and other cool images. We also have a AMOLED screen on the front, which measures 5 inches diagonally, and it's a full HD panel. So Yoda Devices is a manufacturer that is Russian, and it's a relatively new company when it comes to making smartphones. Uh, the original Yoda phone came out in 2013, and it featured an even smaller display, but again, the Yoda Phone 2 was really when the company came into more mainstream attention. Other elements of the phone include NFC, there's wireless Bluetooth, and there is wireless Qi charging. So again, it's a very fully decked device when it comes to features uh, for its time, truly a flagship level contender. So the device is turned on, and again, the screen here is a little bit muted in terms of color, but it is an AMOLED screen. We can tell because if we go into a panel that's a little darker here, the black is very inky against the text, such as whites. Uh, the phone also features a 8 megapixel camera on the back with autofocus, a little bit disappointing because the original Yoda phone had a higher megapixel count. The phone is otherwise made out of polycarbonate plastic, so if we take a closer look at the design now, the top has a 3.5mm headphone jack, on the bottom there is a micro USB port along with a loudspeaker and microphone combo, and on the right hand side there is a power key and a dedicated volume rocker. What's very interesting here is the volume rocker also dubs as the SIM card tray, so you can physically pop this out, so definitely a very unique thinking uh, from the manufacturer. In a world where many devices look alike, it's definitely refreshing to see a manufacturer try to be different and experiment with their handsets. The back here is also made out of a corny Gorilla Glass, which is curved just to make it feel more ergonomic. It's also a capacitive touchscreen on the ink. Uh, it measures roughly 4.6 inches diagonally, so it's a little smaller than the front display is, and it displays a clock as well as weather information and some basic notifications when not in use. So let's take a closer look at the UI of the phone. It's technically running on Android 4.4 KitKat, which is a little bit on the outdated side by now, but you can still install any of the modern games and apps that you would want to find in the Play Store. The phone comes with 2GB of RAM, which was standard back in the day, but a little on the lower side now. Otherwise, in terms of bezels, the left and right are actually very respectable. They have pretty prominent chins on the top and the bottom, though, comparable to a Google Pixel phone, as you can see here. So first, let's try and take a closer look at what makes this phone unique through that secondary display. We're going to take a look at something called Yoda Hub, which is uh, what allows you to customize the e-ink panel on the back. You can change things such as the clock and the weather. You can actually delete these like widgets or tiles, a little bit reminiscent of Windows Phone, and swap them out for different designs. Right now, I also have a separate panel for things like e-reading and another one for displaying battery remaining, as well as a dialer pad, and another one here, which is for a custom wallpaper. And by default, by using the accelerometers, when you are using the phone with the regular AMOLED screen, the back screen is locked, so it prevents accidental triggers and touches. And when you're ready to use it, simply tap on the key down below here, and then drag up slowly. You'll feel a haptic vibration, and now the touchscreen is active. We have the clock here, and I can swipe to the right to have access to my ebook. Right now, it's just showing a very quick user guide. If I wanted to read that, I can tap it once, and again, we have a reader view, which is pretty similar to a Kindle. 
The next panel over is showing you our estimated battery life remaining if we only use the back display, which is about five days, on 40% charge. So that's, again, very impressive. Uh, if you use the phone on the front display like a normal phone, it will last you through about a day, a day and a half before you need to top it off. But again, using the ink panel is how you prolong the battery performance. Over here, we're also able to access things like the dialer pad. If I want to call someone very quickly, uh, you have access to a pretty traditional looking layout. You can still make and receive calls, but you do need to flip the phone over because there's no headset and speaker on this particular side. And I can even check emails and SMS text messages. If I wanted to compose a new message, in fact, you even get a virtual keyboard that uh, pops up. The screen here, in terms of touch responsiveness, is very good. It's just because of the e-ink's lower refresh rate, um, there's a bit more lag, so you have to type more carefully. So for instance, this is a test. Now again, these are widgets, so I can tap on them, for instance, like the weather, to take a look at the temperature information. And finally, the last panel over is going to be the wallpaper that I have chosen uh, that uh, is a static image, as you can see here. Now, I can also long hold on the home key and swipe upwards if I wanted to simply see a mirror of the... And it takes, again, a second to refresh itself, and now we just have the regular layout. I can long hold on this to unlock it, tap on home again, and we have access to what we see on the primary display flipped over to the back. So yes, technically you can also you know game or watch a video, but it's completely in black and white and not very enjoyable. Where it's more useful is if you want to you know share a specific image or if you want to uh, read an article or a web page. When I'm satisfied, I can just again long hold again and exit, and we're back into this altered interface. Whenever you flip the phone over, again, it basically automatically locks itself using the accelerometer, and now we have to unlock it again using the swipe up gesture. The same gesture can be performed on the front display as well, so you can also start from the bottom bezel and swipe up slowly to uh, access the display, as opposed to double tap, for instance. So if we take a closer look at some other apps which are unique, Yoda apps are the handful of games and titles that Yoda Phone have built on in, and these are mostly going to be uh, kind of games like chess, checkers, Sudoku, 2048. So for instance, if I want to play chess, what's interesting is that this game is also done on the rear display. So let's try and continue a game, for instance, and it says the application has been updated on the always on screen. So we can turn this off, flip over, and the game is now performed on the ink panel. So again, these classic uh, titles like chess and checkers make a lot of sense because you're only looking at black and white pieces anyways. Now let's dive into some of the more ordinary aspects of this phone, including the camera first, and see how it stacks up. So again, it has an 8 megapixel shooter, a little bit on the low side in terms of resolution count, but uh, again, megapixels aren't everything. So if we place an object on here and do a live demo, we can tap to focus and to snap a shot. So for instance, I can tap on this to create a panorama or begin recording video. I can tap on this to change the flash settings. There is an HDR mode that we can access, which is nice and nice to see. And I can also switch into the front facing camera, but that's pretty much it. So not a lot of tricks. Taking a closer look at some of these shots here, again, uh, under good lighting environments, such as outdoor settings, you can actually capture some fairly decent results. If you pinch all the way in, of course, you get some softer details. Again, 8 megapixels isn't, you know, that impressive anymore. Now we are more used to at least 12 or 13, but at least it captures a fair amount of detail with HDR. It just, it just takes a split second longer to process the photo, but a nice amount of detail in the shadows, and also the skies aren't too overexposed. Colors are fairly accurate, and uh, close-up shots also don't look that shabby. The front-facing selfie camera is also passable, but again, it doesn't do a tremendously good job in low light, and you have to hold very still because there isn't any stabilization of any sort. You can get some pretty blurry results if you shake accidentally. Now a quick look at uh, video playback. So we are just using a regular browser and going to the mobile version of YouTube. Scrolling seems still, again, quite smooth so far.
audio quality is actually a little better than expected. There's more richness and bass than I was thinking from you know a fairly small looking speaker on the bottom, but it's a mono speaker. The side here actually doesn't do anything, it's just for the microphone placement. Uh, overall it's passable again, you can always use your own headphones or you can use Bluetooth if you want to improve on the quality. AMOLED panels are more energy efficient, especially when it's displaying just something like darkness or black, so it also helps the phone conserve on battery. Speaking of, the phone packs a 2600 milliamp hour pack. This is a decent figure, and as I discussed, it will last you through a day, a day and a half without too many issues, especially when you can use uh, Qualcomm's Quick Charge, this is the charger it comes with, and it has a pretty interesting light up logo when you plug it into the wall, the Yoda phone logo pops onto life. We've done throwback reviews on a few other devices recently that uses the Snapdragon 800 or 801, and I've been again quite impressed with how well those chips have held up, and this is no exception. It still performs really well when it comes to scrolling and web browsing, even on desktop versions of sites, and uh, I think that in real-world performance, it's still going to be a little bit faster and snappier than the Snapdragon 625. The only downside is going to be RAM, because you only have 2 gigs on board, and now we're trying to load up CNET's full desktop page has a pretty complex site with lots of ads, videos, and patterns, and uh, scrolling and everything still feels just really smooth. So again, overall web browsing still works quite well. Other things include a darker theme on top of many of the utility tools, including the calculator, which is again darker than standard Android, in addition to things like the clock app, which you can tell has this dark theme, which takes advantage of the AMOLED panel. Taking a look at settings, it is very stock looking, so that's one of the things I do enjoy about Yoda phone. They keep it very clean, and then on top of it, they add some useful tricks, which are uh, important because of the secondary display, so you can access that function. We can tap on a bat phone, and indeed we are running on Android, again 4.4.3, so KitKat on this particular device. So that's more or less it as far as our revisited review of the Yoda Phone 2 in 2018. Is this still a device I would recommend picking up? Well, it really depends on the user. If you're someone who reads back a lot of articles, uh, a lot of ebooks, and you don't want to carry around something like a Kindle as well as your phone, this is something that fits into your pockets. It's really sleek and, again, has a very fascinating secondary e ink panel, which again, makes quite a bit of sense. There are many applications which you can still use it. As far as performance is concerned, it's also held up quite well because of Yoda using fairly flagship-oriented specs for its time. However, the phone will not receive any updates down the road, so uh, if you want something that's going to be up-to-date in terms of security, uh, as well as maybe a larger display for watching back videos and media only, then perhaps you should check out a more current device. This is definitely more of a niche, collectible phone at this point. With that being said, there is quite a large gap between something like this, the Yoda Phone 2, and the new Yoda Phone 3, which, again, in terms of processing power, isn't super impressive, but because it's new, they're charging around $700. So you can check out more details about this in the links down below and Yodafone devices in general, but for now that's been our video, thanks for watching here at OS Reviews, that's been a revisited look at the very unique dual display e-ink touting Yodafone.